let's be ambitious today. Let's go with how electricity works. And, uh, you know, we're going to skip over the really, really basic stuff. And we're going to get into starting here with Coulomb's Law. All right. Um, so first principles. Number one, um, in electricity, one Coulomb of charge, this is kind of a bit of a repeat, but it's good to have here, is the amount of charge you get when you have a collection of 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons or protons uh, together. Okay, So it's the amount of charge carried by this number of electrons or protons. Why that number? It's vestigial, um, and actually, technically, it's not an SI unit. Um, it basically works like this. One amp, which is the flow of current, we'll get there in a second, is equal to one Coulomb every one second. So the Coulomb is actually defined as one amp seconds, right? So we'll just rearrange this formula. We'll say one amp for one second delivers one Coulomb of charge. Yeah, and so like just to clarify, like what this essentially means is if we could say like strip out this many electrons and like somehow like collect them all in one area, like a jar or a ball or something, we would say the amount of charge on this ball is equal to one coulomb of charge, right? Um, and charge, like when you say, well, what is charge? Um, Charge is what is required to create an electric field. I guess is one way to one way to say it. Charge is a, a one of the properties of electrons and protons. I guess of certain subatomic particles. Um, but what is it like? Explicitly, it's sort of uh, tough to exactly say what it is. The property of of these things, um, like spin, right? That's another one that's kind of hard to talk about uh, or make sense of directly. We know intrinsically kind of what it is, but to explicitly describe what we mean when we say charge, we have to almost default to it is a property of charged particles, of certain particles. They have this thing called charge. We can measure it. We can detect it. But what exactly is it? It's like saying, what's gravity? We can detect its effects. What actually is making it happen? What actually is it? It's, that's harder to um, describe and explain. So then, you know, if we take this amount of charge as being the definition of an electron, we could then say that an electron or a proton has an elementary charge, and this is the symbol for it for elementary charge, is just simply what one of these things would have. So one coulomb is split up into 6.25 times 10 to the 18 individual elementary charges, and that elementary charge is the extremely small 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. I'm not saying you have to like memorize that value, but it's used like a lot in physics. Okay, so just back to um, back to charge in general. Um, so like charges repel and opposite charges attract, and there's only two types. And we know that. And by definition, we call them positive and minus. Okay? Positive is carried by protons. Negative is carried by electrons. Uh, eventually, when we get to current electricity, it is electrons that actually move. Electrons physically move. Okay. However, current electricity is based on moving positive charges. And that is confusing, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. This is called classic, classical current, or classic flow. So where does Coulomb's law come into play? So let's imagine this. Let's imagine we have two point charges 
But instead of drawing points, I'm just going to draw some balls because they are easier to write inside. Okay. There's two of them. And what we're going to say is, first of all, we'll consider them to be neutral. Okay. So right now these things are neutral. Neutral. And neutral. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to remove some electrons from here. And we're going to put them over here. Okay, if we take electrons out of this and put them here, we're adding negative to this. So we're going to go higher towards the negative here, right? By removing negatives from here, we're going to move this towards the positive, right? So a way to think about this is imagine inside here there's a plus and a minus and a plus and a minus, a proton and an electron, a proton and an electron. Okay, then we're going to take one of these electrons out of here and we're going to put it in here. Okay. I know I'm being like ridiculously simple here. I just want to make sure we all know what we're talking about. So now what I could say is that this ends up with a positive charge of plus one, and this ends up with a charge of negative one. So far so good? Okay. Now we're going to erase this. We're just going to say that in general, one is positive and one is negative, and that is how we would make them so from neutral objects. Okay, so it's not like they're empty. They're not empty, they're made of matter, so they're made of positives and negatives. But in order to give them an unbalanced charge, you have to remove some electrons from one and add some to the other. So we said this was negative and this was positive. So Coulomb's law talks about how much attractive force you're going to find between two different charges. So to denote charge, we use Q. And I'm going to use a big Q and a little Q. Okay. In this case, there would be an attraction between these two objects. Attraction, right? And in this case, um, that just happened. Apparently, well, I'm trying to put more circles in here. Well, anyway, um, I'll just draw new ones. You could also have this scenario, right? You can make them both positive, and then you'd have repulsion. You can make them both negative, and then you'd have repulsion. Okay? Now, this law of Coulombs works either way. Okay? Works either way. And I'm going to give it to you now. So he said that the force of attraction or repulsion that you feel is equal to K. That's Coulomb's constant. Q times Q. So that's this. And you're going to divide that by r squared. So this looks really, really familiar to you because it's exactly the same form, same form as Newton's universal law of gravitation. Okay, and we've already dealt with this r squared thing, but let's just break this down and find some um, equivalencies. So. Fe is proportional to the size of, oops, sorry, size of my charges that I have in here. Okay, I raise one charge, this goes up accordingly. I raise the other charge, this goes up accordingly. I raise them both, well, this goes up at the you know multiplication between those two values. So force proportional to the size of the charge, and of course force inversely proportional to how far apart these things are. Okay. Well, why should it be so? Because exactly like with gravitational fields, we have electric fields around these guys. And as you get farther away, okay, the density of electric field lines in three dimensions passing through surfaces drops off at a squared distance. Because the surface area of these you know, shells, if you want, of sphere grow exponentially or grow at a square to the distance from the center. And therefore, the density of um, electric field through them decreases at a square, and that's and that's why you get inverse square laws in general. Okay, so now you're going to ask me, well, what's k? Before I answer that, we just need to realize that q is measured in coulombs. In real life situations, like with like say a couple of balloons or something, you're probably dealing in the range of micro coulombs. Okay, so real life situation. A re if you put a real coulomb in here. You can see that you're going to get an insane amount of force. Okay, and the reason why um, is because of the value for k, the value for Coulomb's constant. So what is k? 
K is a way of basically, um, it's a conversion factor if you want, converting charge and this into force. So I'm going to give you the number and the magnitude, and you're going to give me the units for it. So it's 8.99 times 10 to the 9. Now, what units are going to come after this? Remember, we've got to convert um, two charges in coulombs divided by meters squared, right? So we're in SI units, so this is in meters. This is charge in coulombs, this is coulombs constant. What units are we going to have to have on coulombs um, constant? Here, I'm just write that down. Coulombs constant. Just like Newton's gravitational constant. This is Coulomb's electrical constant. So we know that at the end of the day, we've got to be left in Newtons. Right? So it's got to have Newtons in it. And we know it's going to have to cancel off two Coulombs. And we're dividing it by the square of meters. So it should have meters squared on it. So we want to keep Newtons. We want our answer to come out in Newtons. And we need to cancel off the two um, Coulomb charges here. And we need to get divided off by these two um, meters squared here on the bottom. So they're going to be in the positive. So there's your units. OK. So now, what's the deal with K? So I'm going to give you like a little bit of extra information about K. Um, K is also defined like this. It's actually sort of defined by the properties of um, the universe itself. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, I guess. And it's 1 over 4 pi um, times E naught, where E naught is the permittivity of free space. So um, the E value in, in here, this E, this permittivity of free space, has the following value. Um, 8 point, 8.845 times 10 to the negative 12 units wise. All right, so let's, uh, let's just do a quick little example. Find, let's, we'll get crazy with this. Find the electrical force, between a 1 Coulomb plus charge and a 1 Coulomb negative charge if they are placed one hundred meters apart. Okay, so yeah. So this is going to maybe illustrate viscerally how actually like big how one coulomb of charge would be. You might get a coulomb of charge or two in um, in a lightning strike. Uh, it's it's big. Um, so F E equals K Q Q all over R squared, um, where K is 8.99 times 10 to the 18. No, it's not. Sorry. <laughs> Times I newtons squared coulombs. And then you have one coulomb times one coulomb divided by one hundred squared. Excuse us just about well it's actually eight point nine nine, right? Eight point nine nine times ten to the five. Okay, now that's a little bit like uh, inaccessible. Let's figure out how 
many kilograms of pole that would be the equivalent to. So we just simply take this, and we say, you know, if we put something with this many newtons on a scale, it would it must have a mass of what? Right? So we're doing m over a this is going to give us the. Um, actually, sorry, no, we're not doing that. We're doing m equals f over a. That's what we're doing, and a happens to be g. Um, so that's like dividing by ten. It's like saying we have 8.99 times 10 to the 4 kilograms of pull. Yeah, about 90,000 kilograms worth of pull. Okay, so that's like saying you'd need like a cable holding this, capable of holding back 90,000 kilograms. That's crazy, the amount of force. So in reality, we never deal with anywhere near an entire coulomb of collected charge in one place. If we did, we'd, we'd be blasting like lightning bolts off of this um, long before we ever got a chance to build up that much charge on something. Okay? Um, yeah. All right, so our next step then is to talk about how these things are interacting. There's got to be something acting between them, right? We call that an electric field. It's the area within which electrically charged matter feels a force. So we're going to describe that now. Okay. So um, I believe IB uses E for electric fields, I think, which can be a little bit confusing because it's also energy. You just got to be careful where you're using it. It might be E, E. I'm not sure. But that like could also be elastic potential energy depending. You just got to make sure you're paying attention to what you're talking about. Um, yeah. So anyway, and then that's over Q. So I'm just going to explain this. So if you think about gravity, because there's a very good like analogy here, and you think about a, a, a mass, right? We say we have a gravitational field around Earth, which we call little g. Well, little g is determined by how many newtons of pull every kilogram of mass experiences here, right? So around Earth, we get 9.8 newtons of pull for every kilogram of mass we bring inside. So we can test the gravitational field strength of any object simply by taking like a one kilogram test mass, putting it where we want in the field, and figuring out how much force there was. If we went to the moon near the surface, we'd only get 1.6 newtons per kilogram. So the gravitational field of the moon is weaker, right? We can figure that out by simply taking a test mass and placing it around the moon. Make sense? We can do the exact same thing with charge. So we're going to talk about a test charge now. So let's say, and we'll talk with positive here, let's say we have a positively charged sphere. What we're going to do is we're going to probe it with a test charge. And the thing about test charges is test charges are always positive. Okay? And the test charge is going to have like a spring scale attached to it. And what it's going to measure is how many newtons of force we get for every coulomb of charge. Sorry. How much force we get for every coulomb of charge we get, or, for, or newtons per coulomb is what we're after. Okay? Force per amount of charge, force measured in newtons, charge measured in coulombs. So how many newtons per coulomb of force we get? And we're going to indicate that by showing an arrow in the direction that that force would be felt. So if a test charge is always positive, what we end up with is positive field lines or positive charges have field lines that point out of them. If we switch the scenario and we now probe a negative charge with a positive test charge, Oops. Because the test charge is always going to be positive, right? Always going to be positive. There it is again. No matter where we place this thing, the vector of force is always pointing away. Okay, so this is in a new scenario. Where we get interesting, though, is if we have two charged objects. Now let's think about what happens if we put a test charge in here. 
There's our positive test charge. What does the force vector look like right now? Well, it just looks like this. Okay. But what if we move it like up here? Well, something different happens. It's repelled away, right, from here. But there's also some influence of attraction from over here. So now what we have to do is we have to start considering vector addition on these things. It's a little more interesting now. So let's just imagine what we have here. We've got this vector pushing away. We have this vector pulling towards. If we add those two vectors together, we get a new vector that looks like this. Okay. Good. As I move closer to this, say, or in this direction, this gets larger, and the direction of that field line changes at a given point in space. So now you have to imagine, use your brain, well, what's it going to be like, say, over here? Well, it's going to be like repelled away or pushed away, but it's also going to be slightly, but not very much, because I'm farther away here, attracted back this way. So I'm probably going to point like down here at this point. Okay. So what we're going to do is use this logic to sort of map out what the overall field lines would be like at any point around here. And I'm going to kind of, it's hard for us to do this in the lab. You can do it with magnets, but it's pretty hard to do with electric fields. What you end up with is something that looks like this. Okay, so it's going to have this like curved shape to it. And what that is, is the sum of the vectors from each of these things, right? Of course, here and here, you'd be straight in and straight out. But you get field lines that like look like this, okay, permeating out into space, all right? And if we were to change them to both being, say, positive, now something else that's neat happens. Well, what if I go right in the middle? These are both equal. Then I have one that way and one that way, and I have no field in the middle whatsoever. So there's zero field in the middle. So if you think about that in terms of what the field lines must be doing, I'm pushing away from here, but I'm also pushing away from here. One thing that really helps me to think about this is I like to imagine the field lines kind of like wind. Okay? The field lines are like where the wind would blow. So if you imagine that wind is like blowing out of this in all directions. If it's all by itself, the wind is, is just blowing out of positive. I drew this backwards, didn't I? You should all be pointing in. Whoopsie daisy. Not very, not very good there, science guy. If it's a positive test charge. It's all got to point in. If you're still watching this video, I apologize. These all point in. Hopefully you caught that. Okay. I got it right down here. Out of positive and into negative. Okay? But if you think of it like wind, right? Just imagine this is blowing wind out of it in three dimensions, in three directions. That wind blows positive charges away, and it or sucking in, the wind is blowing in, it's pulling those charges in. Now if you imagine you put two things blowing wind out, um, the wind is gonna run into the other wind and it's gonna like redirect itself. Okay? Or if you have a situation where wind is blowing out but getting sucked back in you get this kind of a shape. If you think of it like wind, I find that it makes it a bit easier to understand. Okay? So it's like a wind hole. Yeah, wind hole. Wind hole. Okay, and if they were both negative, you'd get the exact same thing. It's just you would just change the direction on your vector arrows. Okay? Um, so, let's figure something else out. So we said this, the force on an object is going to be equal to Q times its field strength, right? There's its field strength in newtons per coulomb. There's how much charge we're placing in the field. So newtons per coulomb times coulomb, we should get a value in, in newtons. But we also know this, K, little q, big Q, all over R squared. Right? So what we can do is we can just say this. Q times the field strength should give us the same value as our two charges hanging out. And then we can say this. 
this represents here, just before we move on, this represents our test charge, right? This is our test charge. So in this case, this is our test charge, and this is our main charge, right? Our main charged object. So what we want to be able to do here is we want to say, okay, let's imagine I have a charge of like X coulombs, blank coulombs, and I move like four meters away from it. What's my field strength going to be like here? What is E here? Or like, let's say I'm only like two meters away from it. Well, what's my E there? I don't actually need to use a test charge. I just use Coulomb's law and how I define my fields to begin with, cross off the test charge, and I can figure out in terms of newtons per coulomb what the field strength will be at any point away from this charge. Does that make sense? So let's just do the very last thing that we need to do. What happens in a scenario like this? Let's say you got a positive charge. Let's say you've got a negative charge. Let's say this is like 5 microcoulombs. Let's say this is like 10 microcoulombs. And let's say you want to know right here, what is E? What is E at this point? So if you remember the whole wind thing, wind is blowing out towards this, but it's also sucking in towards this, right? So it's going to be something probably like this, except now this is much stronger, right? So it's probably going to be like maybe a little less pronounced. You might get like your pull like coming from up here more, right? And down and in, okay? So it's going to change it a bit. It's like making this wind much stronger. It's going to grab this wind and pull it. So what we want to know is at this point, what is the direction? And what is the strength of the field? Now we need to know something. Say this is one meter. Say this is 0.75 meters. So how are we going to solve this? Well, we're going to have to go back to our old friend vector addition. We're going to find E from, we'll call this A, which is, of course, positive test charge pointing to the right. And then we're going to add that to E from B. We'll call this B, which is going to be down like that. We're going to sum the two fields, and we're going to find what the field strength is at this point in space. Should we try it? I don't think we'll, I think we got enough time. Um, so we know this, right? Field strength is E equals K times our charge. In the first place, it's A divided by R squared. So, 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 so. So let's do that. Um, so we've got 8.99. Probably just call this 9, actually. 9 times 10 to the 9. It's easier to remember. Okay. Okay. Times Q. Remember, we're finding field strength now. 5 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And we're 1 meter away, so 1 squared. And this is acting to the right, and it's acting to the right because we always measure fields based on a positive test charge. So we'll calculate that and see what we get. So the math on this should give you something like 45,000 newtons for every coulomb I put there, and that points to the right. Okay, so that's based on this. Now let's figure out this guy. Should be bigger, right? Let's call that E from A. Let's change it. Now we want the field strength based on B, K, um, QB is 10 microcoulombs now. It's a little bit closer together, a little bit closer to it. Okay, so we should still have K in there. I'm just going to leave off my units. I know that's not good practice, but get them up here. So we've got 160,000 newtons for Coulomb. And these values seem really large, right? But that makes sense. They should be big because if you ever actually got a Coulomb there, you know, it's such a large value that you're going to have these like massive, massive forces going on. But you're never going to get anywhere near that. And this is downward, right? Because it's towards the negative, into the negative, out of the positive. And that's by definition, right? Um, so now what we do is we do a, a field triangle. 
Well, the field pushes with 45,000 coulombs this way and pulls with 160,000 coulombs this way. And we just need to figure that out and we need to find ourselves an angle, right? So we'll do pith to find the overall field strength there. So E equals 45,000 squared, and that's newtons per coulomb, plus 160,000 squared, again, newtons per coulomb, and see what we get for E. So I get about like 167,000. Okay, and then to find this angle, um, we'll do uh, the inverse tan of opposite over adjacent. So it should be pretty close to straight down, I think. So I get about 74 degrees. Okay, and this is newton per, newtons per coulomb. So what are we really saying here? What we're saying is that if you were to draw all of your field lines in here, they'd be warped in such a way that by the time you got here, your field has an instantaneous vector at that point of 167,000 newtons per coulomb and 74 degrees. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that is a 74 degree angle. I think that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, down down from right. Oh, yeah, I'm not drawing in the right spot. That's the problem. No wonder that's not feeling good mentally. <laughs> it's in the wrong spot. Yeah. Okay. So we're talking here. Here's our 74 degree angle here. That's better. Okay, so that's this instantaneous field at this point, you get this. So then I could ask you a question. What if I put a one coulomb charge here, what would feel this much force at that angle? What if I put a like, you know, a one one millionth of a coulomb there? That's a little more realistic. How much force would it feel if I put it at this point and that's the direction that it would be? And you know what? That's where we're going to wrap it. That's a long video. Bye.